Okay, let's get started. We've got a few people in the room. Welcome uh, to those who've joined us. We're uh, going to be talking about web application firewalls today. Um, the uh, And then also, if you've got any questions, feel free to uh, put them in the chat so that we can uh, answer them at any time during David's discussion. Great to have you here, David. Hey, thanks a lot, Mark. Good to be here. Yep. Uh, great. So we're also this is being recorded, so people will be able to watch this uh, later on the um, New York um, uh, downloads of all the videos as well. So great resource to have. Um, I know you've got very particular views on you know why people think web application firewalls. Like once you've got that in, you're done with doing security, and you're you're here to correct that. <laughs> Correct that um, <laughs> uh, m misthinking. Um, the do you have a slide deck you want to share for us today? I, I am going to share one. Uh, well, a title slide and then one slide, one real slide. So yeah. Right. Let's uh, let's walk through that for, through that, and I'll let you know if anyone um, jumps out with a question in the chat. Okay, that'd be great. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. So I should be displaying my screen now. Um, again, this yeah this. Uh, this presentation is called Why a Web Application Firewall Isn't Enough. Uh, and we could probably have a, a much longer conversation about the value of web application firewalls in general. Uh, before coming to No Name Security, I, I worked for NSS Labs for a while, and uh, NSS Labs was a, the premier testing company for cybersecurity platforms. Uh, we we tested a, a lot of cybersecurity applications and programs and and uh, products uh, and were able to rate those. And I can tell you from experience that one of the things that we discovered through our research, and, and I was uh, the uh, principal research architect uh, in the company, uh, was that there has actually been a, uh, a reduction in the use of API gateways for a lot of organizations. They're very expensive to maintain. Uh, they take a lot of manpower to to keep uh, tuned and operating the way that you, that you want them. Uh, to set up each application uh, requires a considerable amount of time and effort. Uh, and as a result, what happens is is that they fall out of out of tune. They they don't get maintained as much as they should, and they aren't as effective as they should. All of that aside. I still think organizations that can afford it and know how to use them and are willing to do put the effort in to maintain them are definitely far ahead in protecting their web applications by having web application firewalls. So please don't leave this meeting and say, David Thomason said, we don't need web application firewalls anymore, or they're useless, or they're not, you know, th that's not what I said. They are extremely valuable. I think they prevent a number of different uh, attacks. Uh, do, is there some overlap between a good API security platform and a web application firewall? Well, of course. But if you're looking to have zero overlap, you're going to have maximized gaps <laughs> in your environment. You, there, you're always going to have, your IPS is going to be able to block some of the attacks that might happen on a, on a web application. And, and as a result, there's some overlap between your IPS and your web application firewall. In fact, we did a test one time between a URL filtering capability and a web application firewall and found that the URL uh, filtering along with some uh, DNS reputation filtering uh, blocked about 90% of what the, what the web application firewall blocked. So there was a tremendous amount of overlap. Is that 10% that you were missing worth it to spend the money? depends on who you are, where you are, and what, what you have at risk, right? So I can't make that decision for, uh, for any customer. They have to make that based on, on their risk analysis. So I, like I said, I have only one slide to talk about web application firewalls, but I definitely would love to, uh, to hear your questions. So if during the presentation I say anything that, that brings up a question, please uh, drop it in the Q&A. Uh, I would love to talk with you more. Uh, about it, and we'll we'll try and hit those. And I definitely have plenty of time uh, in my presentation to to cover questions. So uh, let's get started. We're we're four minutes in. Um, web application firewalls. How does a web application firewall differ differ from an API security platform? And that's really what we're what we're uh, outlining here. Um, web application firewalls are rule based, um, and as a result. 
somebody has to be tuning those rules pretty consistently. Oftentimes it requires that you know the port number and the top level domain and the, the URIs. And if the URIs or if the uh, endpoints associated with that application change based on the API, then you have to, you have to know those and, and work those in as well. That is a tall order, uh, oftentimes requiring a lot of integration, a lot of communication back and forth with the uh, development teams, with the DevOps teams, and the web application firewall or security teams. Because it's most often that the web application firewall is, uh, uh, is managed by the security team. And my background is all in security, and in looking at the, the folks here on the, uh, on the call today or on this presentation, looks like most of you are in security as well. Um, and so I'm going to take it from a, more of a security perspective than a developer's or a DevOps perspective. But with a good API security platform, and again, you know, blatant pitch for no name here, uh, there is no, uh, no tuning required. It learns exactly where the APIs are without having uh, to do any tuning. Essentially by mirroring traffic, by integrating with the API gateways, which can all be automated uh, very, very quickly, we can identify all the APIs. And so you don't have to know where they are. You don't need to build rules around them. It's already done. Uh, the web application firewall is also a perimeter device. Um, so as a perimeter device, it's limited to seeing what's going through in and out the perimeter through that established route in and out of the out of the perimeter. And what we see over and over and over again with organizations, especially those that are moving to the cloud, is that as they expand their cloud environment, they're putting in more devices, more load balancers, more public IP addresses, and things get missed. And it is a rare occasion now when we do a proof of concept or a proof of value test for a customer and go in and don't find APIs that are exposed to the internet, but are intended to be internal only. So let me let me paint the picture if I can for you. And I, I probably should have a picture for you, but I, I don't right now. And so let me paint this picture. And the picture is you're utilizing an API on an internal EC2 instance in AWS, for example and somebody adds another application into that account, uh, that AWS account, and they utilize either the same EC2 instance or they utilize another EC2 instance and put a, a load balancer uh, in front of it and it connects to the original EC2 instance that has the API. Now, that API's route isn't published out to the internet. It's not like the top level domain is visible. However, that public IP address is visible, and if somebody is able to guess or derive the URI for that API, they potentially could have access directly from the internet without going through uh, an API gateway, without going through a web application firewall. So that is the challenge of the web application firewall. It's meant to be that perimeter device, but what we see often is that the perimeter is dissolving. It's so much easier for platforms and programs and applications to avoid uh, perimeter devices uh, or to accidentally get routed that way. And we know from experience that if you look at some of the, the most recent uh, 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 research that's been done on the API vulnerabilities, it, now whether it's from a, uh, a bug bounty or whether it was from a pen test or whether it was from an actual uh, attack on the uh, API and they lost records like in the uh, LinkedIn case, uh, those particular situations were APIs that were designed probably to be internal or to be protected behind an API gateway and were able to get to that data without utilizing those, uh, without utilizing those API gateways and so, or without having to go through them. So at the end of the day, a good API security platform, on the other hand, will find the threats and the vulnerabilities throughout the network, regardless of what the perimeter is. It'll look at all of the devices in the environment. For example, again, the no-name platform will look at your API gateways, will integrate with those, will integrate with your EC2 instances uh, and your load balancers, and will look at the configuration of those devices. And we'll be able to tell you, based on the route tables and the actual traffic that we're seeing, that there is uh, 
a route for an API that could be uh, uh, accessed from the internet without having to go through that web application firewall. So again, uh, it's a perimeter device. An API security platform should go well beyond the perimeter and be looking at everything internal uh, associated with those APIs. We call it the API estate. It's every device, every route, and every ma virtual machine and the traffic all associated with APIs. And again, I, I wanna stop for just a second, give you a chance to, to ask questions uh, before I go on to the next one. Uh, if you haven't uh, taken a snapshot of this screen, now's the perfect time for you to take it if you wanna uh, uh, utilize this data. But Mark, you, uh, you have any questions yet? Yeah, we have. We did come um, have one from uh, in the pre in the pre workshop sign up. So you were mentioning then about API vulnerabilities. What are the one question was what are the biggest? Um, what's the most popular form of of API security attack vector today? Ah, you know, there's a really great website, the uh, OWASP API Security Top Ten, and uh, I would highly recommend if you haven't seen it. it they OWASP started in application security, obviously had a big impact on the way that, that uh, web application firewalls were built. Uh, but in 2019, they realized that the threat vector associated with APIs was different from the threat vectors associated with web applications in general. And they came out with their own API uh, security top 10. And so if you look at those one, you'll see all of the top vulnerabilities. And, and I say, the top vulnerabilities. There are more than 10. Uh, and so we believe that, that we identify you know, quite a few more than those top 10. But the number one uh, on their website is the broken object level authorization. And broken object level authorization is, a, uh, is an API, excuse me. Um, <laughs> uh, broken object level authorization is the, um, is the ability for someone who is authorized and has authentic, excuse me, who is authenticated into the system. Uh, they have already gone through whatever the authentication mechanism is, whether it's a password, whether it's two-factor authentication, or whether it's just another API that has been authenticated as being uh, real. And then it gets access to information for which it is not authorized. And I love the, uh, uh, I love the analogy of a hotel. Uh, when I go to a hotel and I get my room key, I show them my credit card and my ID and they give me a room key. And that room key gives me access to my room only. If I were to go to my neighbor's room and it let me in, that would be broken object level authorization. I've been authenticated, they know who I am, but my key let me into a room that I shouldn't be let into. And this is how, for example, Peloton, uh, they lost a lot of their uh, users records uh, associated or those were compromised via a broken object level authorization. This is what happened to Experian uh, not too long ago where they had a broken object level authorization uh, attack that happened there. Uh, these have happened and, and these are probably the most common uh, and frequent uh, attack vector and unfortunately and that's a great question for this meeting because the the web application firewall, while it does a really good job of seeing things like cross-site scripting and forgery requests um, and all of those kinds of things, uh, traffic um, or path traversal attacks, all of those, uh, it really doesn't do a great job of seeing the logic that is within the APIs themselves. And uh, that may be coming up in one of my next uh, presentations right here. But uh, that is definitely one of those things that um, broken object level authorization that typically gets past uh, a web application firewall uh, and would be protected by an API security platform uh, like No Name. Great. So then you were saying how you're seeing some of the, um, uh, you're, you're identifying some attack vectors outside of that OWASP top 10. Uh, Thomas Holtz has asked, can you briefly describe what a few of those might be that are the ones that aren't listed in the OWASP but that you're seeing as, uh, as a mechanism for getting in? So I'm gonna be coming out with some uh, blog posts and I don't wanna steal my own thunder uh, for that. And so, yes, um, thank you, Thomas. I appreciate the, the request, um, but I would love to uh, uh, meet with you one-on-one -on -one to talk about some of those things. Uh, absolutely. 
um, but I don't want to steal it here in this in this public environment. So, so we're then, up- so when so that'll be on the no name um, website. That'll be coming up on the no name website in the next month or so. Yeah. Okay. Should so, be so should be within the, the next month. There. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, thanks. And then the so when you say so the thing that strikes me when you're talking about we were up to talking about the network perimeter. But then when you're talking about, um, you know, an API security platform being able to find the threats and vulnerabilities throughout the network perimeter and out inside, then the way you were describing that, it sounds like the perimeter is much more, it's much, it's like, it's not like a perimeter in the sense of like a bricked wall that doesn't move. Like now, the depending on the um, architecture and the um, applications that you're delivering, that perimeter changes where it's located. Is that right? Is that absolutely, absolutely? You know, before we had, uh, you know, before we had the cloud environment, uh, we could define the perimeter around our data center. We knew all of the connections that we had out to the internet, and we could layer our security defenses on there. We could put in our our, uh, our router with, with its limitations on it. We could put in our VPNs. We could put our firewalls behind that and our web application firewalls behind that and our load balancers in the line. And then, and, and all of those things uh, created a, like you said, a wall. And that's pretty much why, uh, you know, from the time that we had in, you know, from in the, you know, really in the 80s on a network diagram, when we used the firewall, it was a brick wall. The, the, the icon was typically a brick wall just to just to look like uh, that perimeter around, you know, building a moat, if you will, around your village. Uh, and so, but that has really changed over the past, uh, oh, I don't know, 10 plus years, I guess, now with cloud technologies, that perimeter has dissolved. It's so easy now for things to get past perimeter devices. And and when you think about your your typical office environment, for example, one click on the wrong thing and somebody has now introduced or allowed all the way into the center of your environment uh malware they've clicked on the wrong thing and as a result they're now getting uh you know downloads of something into their environment that shouldn't be there there's one click can take you all the way past all of the different layered devices and so from that perspective the perimeter is gone from the per- perspective that most of our a lot of our infrastructure is moving to the cloud and the cloud is so much more volatile and um, dynamic in its nature and that somebody an administrator can easily stand up uh, a uh, a virtual machine or a uh, a docker or, or kubernetes container and now you've got another port that could potentially have a public ip address on it without you know, depending on how you have governance set up in that in that cloud environment, all of a sudden you've got the potential for holes to be punched in your perimeter, uh, unlike we've ever seen before. And so there is definitely a need to be looking at all of this information uh, with regards to the API perimeter, because those perimeter devices, while they still help, uh, aren't going to protect against things that aren't going through them. Uh, if not, and not everything will flow through those perimeter devices. Make sense? Yep, yep. So let's continue. Thanks. Thomas, if you've got a follow-up question, I'm sorry we couldn't get that one answered for you, <laughs> but if you've got another um, qu- another uh, security question, uh, let's see if we can get David's response to that. Um, cool. Do you want to continue? I think you were talking about um, deployed in line. Yeah, so um, I, I think I hit the second one. Yeah, deployed in line. That's the other thing. Most web application firewalls are, are deployed in line, and yet about 85% of them are deployed in line but not blocking. And in that case, what are you doing? You're introducing latency. Uh, you could you have the potential for a performance impact. You have the potential to uh, drive traffic to uh, additional um, high availability uh, networks because maybe the the web application firewall can't keep up. You have a lot of challenges uh, or a lot of issues that a lot more potential issues uh, when you are deploying in line. API security platform uh, should typically be deployed out of band. 
Uh, that way there's no performance impact, there's no latency introduced, uh, and somebody will say, well, but then you can't block anything. Well, that's not necessarily true. Um, it's true that we aren't going to block something on the first touch. In other words, that, that initial packet that is the exploit isn't going to get blocked. But if you're willing to put up with all of the latency and performance issues in order to get that first touch, then turn it on and, and, and make sure and do it. Because like I said, about 85% of the web application firewalls that we've seen don't have any blocking turned on. They're just simply notifying that there's issues going on there. Uh, on the out-of-band side, we will miss the first touch, that's correct. However, we can very quickly in integrate with, or if we're already integrated with the infrastructure appropriately, we can very quickly send a message to that infrastructure and say, block that IP address, revoke that user's credential, uh, you know, block that, uh, uh, block that endpoint. Whatever those things are, we can go in and take the appropriate action very, very quickly and therefore block in the same way. And at, for the sake of performance and latency, we might miss a record or two, but we won't, but we won't let that attack go on continuously. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and again, web application firewalls are looking really only at HTTPS on well defined ports. Uh, an API security platform will be looking at numerous uh, endpoints uh, and protocols. It doesn't matter whether it's RESTful or SOAP or GraphQL, gRPC, XML, JSON, it, and uh, what any port. If somebody forgets to define it in the web application firewall, it's going to be missed. If we, if you've got a good API security platform, it'll still see it. And we typically identify 30 to 40 percent of the APIs within any organization that produces their own APIs aren't going through the web application firewall or even the API gateway for that matter. They're completely rogue or shadow APIs, if you will. And so as a result, all of those APIs aren't being protected or monitored at all. Um, and I've got to go pretty quickly because I know we've got just a few minutes left, but uh, clients are mostly web browsers, automated traffic and bots can be fairly easily detected. That's true. Um, with the web application firewall. It, those automated traffic and bots can be uh, easily detected. With the API security platform, the clients are most often uh, machines and applications, and it's very difficult to exclude that automatic traffic through a web application firewall. However, on the API security platform, it's very easy to model that behavior, that machine-to-machine -machine behavior. It tends to be very consistent, and as a result, when something isn't working the way it should, when somebody's using a test suite or when they're using a Python uh, script or a uh, something like Burp Suite or Postman to manually manipulate an API that is normally uh, utilized machine to machine, those are pretty easily identified because the, the human always does things differently than the machine does. And then finally, the web application firewall typically looking for attacks that can be easily detected from incoming requests. Again, cross-site scripting and SQL injection, those are also commonly protected by intrusion prevention systems. Uh, but the more difficult ones to detect, like the broken object level uh, authorization, the excessive data exposure, the IDORs, uh, all of those are much, much more easily detected in the API security platform than they are in the uh, web application firewall. And we have deployed in a number of organizations that have uh, both API gateways and web application firewalls. And in our testing, we have shown time and time again that the, uh, the API gateways in the, and the web application firewalls are looking at the bigger picture. They're looking at the application level and not at the API level. And as a result, we typically can break the APIs without them detecting it, but we can integrate back with them to prevent those uh, uh, exploits from continuing. So that kind of wraps up my presentation. That's uh, a big part of why web application firewalls aren't enough. Um, again, if you have any questions or you'd love to get together and, and talk about some of the things that that uh, we've got coming up, like the uh, attack vectors not listed in the OWASP API, Thomas, uh, we'd love to uh, we'd love to do that. Fantastic. Do you want to um, put your uh, email details? or go back to your first slide. I think you've got. Have you got your contact details on that? Or if you could put it in the chat. Um, 
up. Oh, it's not there. So I'll put it in the chat right now. I'm David T at nonamesecurity.com. Great. So people can follow up with you and uh, maybe you could reach out to Thomas and let him know when you've got that article up and online. Okay, wonderful. Great to be with you here again, David. And uh, uh, thanks for walking us through some of those API security issues. And thanks, hey, everyone. My pleasure, Mark. Thanks. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay.